and we'll now move on to our next panel. So I am delighted to welcome members of the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee. We have Greg Clark, who is chair of the committee, Dawn Butler, Carol Monaghan and Catherine Fletcher. By way of background, the Science and Technology Committee is a group of 11 MPs from different parties who scrutinize government policy and expenditure in relation to science and technology. And unlike some other committees, the Science and Technology Committee has a broad remit and cuts across the whole of government rather than just scrutinizing one department as some other committees do. Can I ask the panelists to give a very quick introduction, a, a few sentences, and perhaps your background or interests in science? Um, I'll go to Greg first, then Carol, then Dawn. Thank you, Masro, and it's nice to uh, see my colleagues uh, on the call. Uh, I'm Greg Clark. I'm chair of the committee. Um, I've been the member of parliament for Tunbridge Wells in Kent uh, since 2005. Um, I, I've always been passionate about uh, science and research. Uh, it's worth noting that the committee is not just about the, uh, the physical and natural sciences. Uh, we cover research generally. Um, I, I got a PhD uh, from the London School of Economics. Uh, I've worked in universities uh, in the past. Uh, and in government, uh, I had the great privilege of having one of the best jobs in government, which uh, was uh, universities and science uh, minister. Uh, and then more latterly, from 2016 to 2019, I was the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, which also uh, includes the, uh, the science brief. Um, and during that time, we established the industrial strategy and set a target for R&D uh, investment, 2.4% uh, of national income, including other things. So it's great uh, to be able to uh, continue um, my uh, commitment and engagement with science and technology through the inquiries um, that I'm sharing with my colleagues here. Okay. Carol? Thanks, Masha. Um, yeah, my name's Karen Monaghan. I'm the uh, Member of Parliament for Glasgow Northwest. I um, have been on the Science and Technology Committee pretty much since I was elected in 2015, so it's had given me a chance to see a whole variety of different things. And I think one of the one of the really interesting things about the committee is the opportunity to work on a cross party basis. And we very definitely do. It's one of the opportunities in Parliament where politicians of different colours can get together and can actually um, work together for a common goal. I'm a physicist by profession, so it was it was great for me to actually get onto the Science and Technology Committee. And it's one area of Parliament where I've got to say we it is absolutely evidence based, um, and probably some other parts of parts of Parliament would do well to to listen to some of the the evidence that we hear both in committee and to to look at our ways of working. So thanks very much. Lovely to be here this afternoon. Thanks, Carol. Dawn. Thanks, um, Sarah, and thank you for all of the work that you and all the other clerks do on the committee as well, because um, there's a lot of work and a lot of paperwork. Uh, so I'm Dawn Butler. I'm the Member of Parliament for Brent Central. And um, my first, was well, not my first paid job, but my first sort of main job was a computer programmer. So I programmed in low level languages like COBOL, C++, multimedia. Um, and so that's kind of my science background. Um, I've been a member of the committee now, I'm not sure how long, uh, I think for a year, is it a year? I don't know. But um, it, it's, um, it, I enjoy it actually. And I think during lockdown, it gives you uh, something really meaty to, to get your teeth stuck into because it is, <clears throat> as Carol says, it's evidence-based. So we look at a lot of evidence. We're able to question um, the scientists uh, and those people um, in charge. And so that's quite a fulfilling thing to do. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Catherine. Thanks, Monsieur. And um, so I'm Catherine Fletcher. I'm the MP for South Ribble, which is a bit south of Preston. And um, I did a biology degree. So I have science A levels, I have a biology background, which I've used both in the, in the real world, uh, out in Africa. Um, but actually as a career, 
I was nowhere near as good as Dawn, but I spent many years uh, implementing IT systems and can code a tiny little bit, but not in the really tough stuff that she does. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to questions now. And first up, we have Ain O'Brien, who is representing the Royal Astronomical Society. Hiya, it's actually Anya, but don't worry. I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. I was wondering how my name was going to get pronounced today. <laughs> uh, thank you for this opportunity. With the recent announcement of the ARPA style high risk funding body, which will be known as ARIA, the astronomy and geophysics community would like to understand what is meant by high risk research and how it's going to coexist with existing research bodies in the UK. We'll go to Greg first, then Carol, then Catherine, then Dawn. Greg. Well, thanks, Anya. It's a great question. And we would like to know the answer to that as well. Um, we, we've conducted an inquiry into this, as you've probably seen, when, once we knew that the government was committed uh, to this. And just to kind of reflect on our conclusions, we think it's a, it's a good thing that the, the government's putting more money into to science and 800 million pounds is a lot of money um, and it can definitely be put to good use um, given the, the breadth of scientific talent and opportunity we have. We do think there's a case for, for having an organisation with a kind of culture that is a bit different from the research councils um, and uh, UKRI, um, Innovate UK. That's not a criticism uh, of them because they're the foundation uh, of our scientific excellence. Um, but they, they do have procedures that they go through. They make, as you will know, you probably participate in uh, calls that, are, that reflect certain priorities. And so the idea of somewhere in the system that we have to have an organization that's a bit different and perhaps doesn't need to to demonstrate so in such a watertight way what its results are going to be or what its prospective impact is going to be we think is valuable but and uh, two buts I'd say before colleagues will uh, come in. The first is that 800 million pounds is still a lot of money. So we do need to know that it's going to be money well spent, even if it's not going to be spending quite the same way as it would be by the research councils. Um, and secondly, even 800 million pounds, if you spend it on, you know, 800 different, different projects, you're probably not, not going to get a huge breakthrough. So we think it should, we think we should know a bit more about what its purpose is, um, and, and we don't. So we are having, as, uh, if you're interested, as you clearly are, we're having another evidence session next Wednesday, a week today, 9.30 on Wednesday morning, uh, which should be fascinating because we've got uh, Dominic Cummings, whose idea it was in the first place, and Kwasi Kwarteng, who is now the Secretary of State responsible, one after the other. So we hope by the end of that session, we'll have an answer to your question, Annie, but we don't have it uh, just yet. Thank you, Greg. Carol? Anya, thanks very much for the question. And can I say I've got two daughters called Murren and Neve, both spell in, in Irish ways, so totally, um, totally get where you're coming from. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because what we know and researchers have told us that um, filling out research grants is a lengthy, it's time consuming, it um, takes up more time often than the research itself. And the funding, the awards of funding is often done in a very risk averse way. There are so many checks and balances, constant, you know, having to meet targets and having to come up to scratch. So, so this idea that there's something that, that allows, allows research to take place, possibly in a, a bit more freely, is, is something that could have some merit. Um, as Greg says, we've done an inquiry on this, and, and the question that kept coming up was, what is it we're trying to do with this? What is the, what is the project? And it's, but what I would say is it's been quite interesting if we see the amount of money that's been um, thrown at COVID vaccinations, for example, research into that, we can see that actually if you throw money at something, 
in an intense way, actually you can get rewards. But along the, along the way, you have to accept that there's going to be failure as well. And I think this is the, the idea of this high risk situation is, yes, you can throw money at it, but you might not actually get any, any decent results out of it. So the, the idea that it can tolerate failure, I think, is, is quite important and is one that hasn't probably featured in research grants um, for quite a long time. Um, but what's it for? We don't know. Maybe we'll find out next week. Catherine. Um, I won't repeat what Greg and Carol have said, but as you may, you, as will be an emerging theme from this, we do actually genuinely collaborate on the Science Technology Select Committee and, and enjoy it at the same time. So let me take it off. Let me take your question off in a different direction. Um, what could have been considered high risk, and uh, and could you know to give you an idea? I've been doing a bit of thinking. So, for example, the Fusion Taurus. You know, how many years have we been talking about fusion as a potentially clean energy generating source? That's at least four decades. I mean, we've got exciting research going on in Oxford and they phone up the, they phone up the national grid and say, we're just about to take 23 megawatts out of uh, your system, please, which is, I think, a small town. And then they turn it on and they smash hydrogen together, produce helium and harness the energy. That's the kind of thing for me, you know, really long burn stuff that translates from the theoretical into the practical. And the other thing that's high risk is combining interdisciplinary research. So how are we going to solve the problems of the future is not the biology department not talking to the computing department because the advances that we're taking in data is really going to allow us to understand the complexity within molecular structures, you know, some of the AI stuff to predict from RNA sequences what the folding patterns are going to be for receptors, which is coming forward in COVID. That's a direct collaboration, but we've not solved that problem in the 100 years since we discovered it. So, you know, and it's still not solved. So that's my definition of high risk. And I, I tell you what I'd love to hear is your thoughts on what's so high risk that needs looking at. Are you asking me to answer that now? Well, I'll let Dawn go first. Yeah, good. We'll let Dawn go first and then come I'll back. I think. Um, uh, so um, one of those buts I think that Greg said probably was uh, relating to me because I, I've, I've gone from being, I really, I couldn't see the point in this ARPA and then Ari. I just couldn't, I couldn't see it. Like I couldn't see what the problem was that we were, trying to solve or where the direction of travel was so I just I just didn't get it so to me it didn't make sense but that's the good thing I suppose about being on the science and technology committee and taking evidence is that <clears throat> you get to listen to what everybody's got to say you get to listen to other people's experiences and so from that I've kind of moved a little bit more into the middle from the I don't see the point of it to okay I see the point of uh, investing in science of course and not having somebody breathe down your neck so that you can ex you can experiment, um, I I understand that, and I also understand um, you know like we're going to get the top scientists, for instance, involved in in area. I suppose the 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 issue for me is, do I trust the government and the process? So do I trust having very little oversight of contracts that were. Uh, given during the pandemic, for instance, and knowing that you know some of the contracts were poorly um, uh, poorly given, do I trust that this eight hundred million pounds will go to the leading scientists, or will that be filled with lots of biases of who the leading scientists are, and is it the same old people rather than going to the up and coming people with great you know, burning bright ideas and, you know, and, and the women and the, you know, and the, the diversity in the science community are often ignored. So do I trust that, that that it will go in that direction or will it go to Dominic Cummings' mates? Maybe I'll ask him that next week. I don't know. So, um, so that, so I'm kind of moved from where I was to being informed, a lot more informed because of the committee, but I'm not quite at the, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic idea yet. Yeah. Thanks, Anya. So, on, on that question that Catherine put, go ahead. 
Yeah, um, well, it's actually quite well timed. I don't know if you guys saw about the meteorite that fell last week. Um, I was part of the team that collected some from the field. Uh, most exciting thing to happen in my career, probably ever, like I think everything's downhill from now on. But as a meteoriticist, uh, I fall in the kind of gap between the UK Space Agency and SCFC, uh, especially because I study Martian meteorites. One says you should be in UK Space Agency and the other says SCFC, which means my PhD is actually funded by a bequest to the university because we couldn't get funded from a research council. However, the excitement about this meteorite has been stratospheric, excuse the pun, um, but perhaps something like um, a better camera network, perhaps a, um, a low Earth orbit satellite to, to um, watch out for these things when they fall because we've just shown hey if we get one that's amazing but the high risk is we don't know when the next meteorite is going to hit the uk so for me that would be the dream and um, because what we've shown is everyone's got so excited about this first one yeah. of their years we, and i get to study we, it next we don't time. want to be the next set of velociraptors do we <laughs> oh what's that bang <laughs> thanks anya <laughs> thank you Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to our next uh, question, which is from Shannon. And if we sort of try and roughly keep to about 10 minutes per question, uh, that will keep us on time. Shannon Cameron is from the Open University. Shannon. Hello, thank you for having me and inviting me to ask a question. Um, so BBC's Blue Planet 2, brought plastic pollution to the attention of the public in a big way. And great progress was underway to reduce single-use plastics in homes and businesses. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted and reversed much of this progress with massive increases in single-use plastics over the last year. How would you advise the government tackles this plastic pollution pandemic to get us back on track? We'll go to Carol first, perhaps, then Dawn, then Catherine, then Greg. Thanks very much, Shannon. And I have to apologise. I've got Jean the dog here sitting on the couch beside me who keeps, um, she's supposed to go on a walk but won't, so she pops in. Apologies. Um, Shannon, thanks very much. Plastic pollution is something that I think we are all growing increasingly concerned about. And one of the issues is that it's not just that it ends up in our oceans. Often we think we're recycling plastic. We think we're doing the right thing by using recycling facilities. Um, but often these materials are then shipped to other countries and burned, which is, is not really helping the situation at all. Um, I think we have to be a little bit bolder about the action we take when we're, we're looking at plastic pollution. Um, but I think there are some really simple things that we can do. First of all, we have um, we introduced the tax. Now, this is an area that's devolved. So Scottish Government, UK Government have different competencies here. So in Scotland, we introduced a tax. It was actually following Ireland's success on plastic bags. And that has now um, happened across the UK, which is, has been great. And that has really encouraged people to do simple things like take, take their bags with them when they're shopping. But I think we need to be looking at things like bottle return schemes as well, the number of plastic bottles that we see discarded. And many countries have these. Um, so when you go to a supermarket, you just feed your bottles in. Finland do it all the time. You feed your bottles in, you get money back for the bottles that you return um, that you can then use towards your, your shopping. So that's something that could be done. And I know that this has been considered. Um, but maybe we have to be bolder still and look at how we tax plastic. Now, that is not going to be popular. It's not going to be popular amongst producers or consumers. But um, we're at the point where our planet is, it, we can't sustain our planet in the way we're, we're acting just now. So I think we have to be bolder. And unfortunately, I do think governments are going to have to take decisions that are not always popular, but are required. Thanks, Carol. Dawn. Um, yeah, how do we solve a problem like plastic, especially with the pandemic now where everything's about um, doing things individually? You know, you can't share things. You can't share a, a, a picture of water. Um, you know, you need to have your, your individual containers. I think what I would uh, maybe do is building, I mean, I think our target, um, which was to, to achieve uh, zero, waste by 2050 was 
was quite a low target anyway. I think um, it should have been 2035. And so, but I think what we could do is building on what Carol was saying in regards to bottles and things. And I think they've, they're trialing it somewhere and I can't remember where, but you would go to a supermarket outlet with a, a jar or something and you would fill it with cornflakes or something. So instead of having everything pre-packaged, you'll bring your own jars and things and you would just fill it at source. And that would that cuts down on the actual um, packaging from the very beginning. And so that saves a lot of waste. Um, it's quite innovative, but I think it'll be really good. And it saves, you know, it saves on unpacking, it saves on throwing stuff away. And I think that's the kind of vision where we could be looking towards, you know, where people are recycling their own jars themselves. If you're going to go for coffee, you'll bring your empty coffee jar and you fill it up with coffee. You'll probably get more value for money as well, because, you know, it's quite interesting when, you know, they're also making packages bigger and what's inside smaller. Uh, and all of that is just waste. So I would, I would aim for that kind of thing. Thank you, Dawn. Catherine. Yeah, the ladies are right. Um, but let me, let me look at it a different way. This is an international problem. So a lot of the plastic that we see landing on our shores due to the global circulation of the currents has actually gone into the sea somewhere else in the world. So I think this is where we need to speak to friends and partners and countries across the world and do two things. One is create the groundswell of understanding that this is a problem. And I think the world genuinely has been rocked by Attenborough's documentary. You know, the, the seabirds feeding plastic to their chicks has resonated with every human being on this planet. And creating that global awareness of what we do is really important. And I think there's a big re leading role for the government to play in that. But also coordinating the international response. So we've got COP, the Conference of the Parties, COP26 in um, Carol's Glasgow. Um, back down in November and we're hosting the whole world to talk about response to the climate challenge and trying to bring people together and I think that's where the UK can show leadership and the government can actually say look we're doing all of this you know we're the first country in the world with net zero we've got these regulations on plastics and then we can act together um, I think it's much better if we all do it together and then personally I think for, for us right here and now to keep banging the drum it's people like you keep asking those questions saying we're still on single use plastics don't let it drop keep going thank you greg thanks Ms. Rob. well um chair of the science and technology committee a plug for technology in, um, in addition to, to what my colleagues uh, have said um you can make change in fact i um, i got a cup of coffee just before uh, i came on this call from the from the House of Commons uh, canteen, and uh, it's bedgeware, it's, it's um, compostable. Um, and you wouldn't know, it's just the same as uh, anything you might get from a, a commercial outlet. And so as well as having less single use uh, plastics, I think it's also worth, I don't know whether it's one of the ARIA challenges, but to, to have more of what we use being sustainable, and in this case, compostable substitutes. Um, certainly there is no impairment to the, to the experience of drinking coffee. Actually, it would be nicer to, to drink out of, uh, out of a mug, uh, a ceramic mug. Um, but one of, the, one of the challenges that we have um, because of COVID this year is there's been a big increase in disposable uses. Uh, and normally you can get a, a mug of coffee in the House of Commons, you can, I don't think you're supposed to bring it to your office, but you can, uh, but you can sneakily bring it up and return it to the uh, canteen. But that's been stopped. They're all disposable. But at least the technology means that it's not going to uh, be taking a thousand years to, uh, uh, to uh, disintegrate. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Thank you very much for your question, Shannon. Um, and the next up is Benjamin Foster. And Benjamin is representing the Biochemical Society. Benjamin. Hey, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Um, so something that's been clear over the past year is that political decision making really needs to take into account scientific knowledge and information. Um, yet there is 
perhaps at the minute, little incentive for scientists to put time and effort into providing their knowledge to policymakers. What mechanisms do you think, if there are any, um, do you recommend should be put into place to address this issue? We'll go Greg first, then Dawn, then Catherine, then Carol. Greg. Well, it's obviously been a fascinating year for, for, for this because there probably hasn't been a year in which scientists have had such a profile directly in front of the, the public day after day. Um, and, uh, and in part, and this gives me the opportunity to pay tribute to the scientists who've done that because it's been pretty intense. And you know, those of us that, that have chosen to go into politics know that comes with you know, pretty robust debate and scrutiny, and that's what you're in for. But probably, if you're going to a career in, in science, you don't necessarily expect that you'll be interviewed on the Today programme, um, or possibly even being asked to appear before our select committee. I, I hope, as Carol said at the beginning, that we, uh, we aim to be uh, respectful and, uh, and factual. But there has been a huge amount of public service that uh, scientists, both those in the public eye and those that are part of their teams, uh, have done. And I, in terms of incentives to, you know, to kind of generate impact, I think the, you know, the, the, the notion that you're giving public service, that you're contributing to a better world, I, I know is a prime motivation for many people in undertaking a scientific career, and I hope that would continue to be the case. That said, I think there are additional things, and one of the things that the committee has looked at from time to time, and will be doing again, is the science funding system. And obviously, impact um, through part of the, uh, the, the REF um, uh, was, was first designed uh, to, to try and capture that. Now, most people I talk to think that that can sometimes be a, certainly a pretty imperfect and sometimes a kind of crude uh, way of assessing it. But it, it's an attempt, it seems to me, to, to try and acknowledge the point that you make and you know, your views and those of your colleagues on how impact can be properly reflected in funding and in progression, um, I, think is, uh, I think is important. Thank you. Dawn. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so I think, um, and this could be a little bit controversial, but I think in a way, um, you need to take the, the politicians out of the equation. So the Science and Technology Committee, I think is uh, quite unique. We've all got our different interests and specialities. As I say, we learn of each other and there's a lot of respect in that committee. And, you know, when, like when Catherine explained the, the spikes on the protein on the coronavirus, it was just fascinating, you know, and she pointed to the Christmas tree and it was just, you know, and so, but th there's a certain understanding there. And I think, um, and, I, and I think it's respected. And, I, and so there's two things that I think. I think that the government should take reports from like the Science and Technology Committee. They should be um, compelled to take the reports seriously and implement the recommendations because those reports are built from a lot of hard work and a lot of in investigation based on the science. And, and the government has an option whether they consider the report or not. They can just have the report and put it to one side. Depends how much fuss is made of it. And I think that's important. And that's respecting the science. Um, but often, like in government, um, ministers are not people who are experts in that field. They are people who will toe the party line. And that doesn't necessarily mean that scientists get a good audience or get a good outcome from what they're telling ministers. And yesterday when I asked um, Sir Patrick and Professor Valance, you know, what frustrates them the most since the pandemic, uh, they had said, you know, the misrepresentation of what they've said. And so I think that's really important. So, I, so, so somehow I think we need to compel governments to take reports from, from committees seriously, but also maybe have a few more uh, knowledgeable expert ministers in their field. That was quite diplomatic, right? No? <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. Catherine? 
Oh, we have a good, we have a good laugh. I, you'll be astonished to hear that I don't totally share Dawn's view on this, but um, I, but in all seriousness, I think there is a case for more scientists or people with scientific training in the corridors of power. I think Kate Bingham, uh, the, you know, who's recently had such a success with the vaccine task force, she's actually said it in one of our evidence sessions. You know, if you have one thing, I'd have more people in government that understand the science. But I'm going to slightly flip it on its head, Benjamin, if that's all right, because um, what you what what this is not something that doesn't happen uh, in 2013. I'd like to say I was normal. I wasn't, but I certainly wasn't a politician. I don't have any background in it. I just went right. I think we need some more scientists. We need some more normal northerners. I, I you know I picked a football team. Mine happened to be the blue one, and I engaged in it. And actually, when I've got here, I was expecting to find this sea of arts graduates, but the DWP secretary, Therese Coffey, is a PhD chemistry. You know, I won't list them all, but there are lots of scientists within here. So seek them out to push, you know, the questions that you want to ask. But also, don't just think this is something done unto you. Get involved in it. Help us form an APPG, which is a cross-party lobby group. It's not just the select committees that influence government policy. Come and join us. We don't get shouted at that much, honest. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think we might have lost Benjamin, but Carol. Thanks, thanks, Masher. And um, um, whether Benjamin hears or not, I'm sure there's others that, that can listen in. Um, Catherine kind of Catherine said something that I always say when I'm asked this question: Why? How can we get more science in Parliament? And I always say, well, you need scientists to put themselves forward if that's going to happen. Um, so when people ask me this, particularly people with a scientific background, I always um, turn it on them and say, well, have you considered doing it? And I think that's an important, an important point. Um, unfortunately, government decisions are not always evidence-based. They can be the whim of a Secretary of State. They can be um, because they're seen as popularist. They can be because somebody thinks it's the right thing to do. But evidence doesn't always play a, a part in that. And that's, that's what can be quite difficult. But the role of MPs is to scrutinise government decisions. And the role of committees is to scrutinise specific areas of government, be it area or be it um, plastics or um, other areas of science policy. So I think you have to you have to have some confidence in the systems that are set up. And um, when when a committee such as Science and Technology Committee has an inquiry, many people are asked to give evidence. Now, you might be the person that's lucky enough to actually be asked to give oral evidence directly to the committee in an evidence session. But when an inquiry is announced, there's always the opportunity for scientists to feed in. There is the opportunity, and that, that, that means everybody. There is no limits on it. So everybody, whether you're an early stage researcher, early, early career researcher, or whether you've been a professor for 40 years, Everybody can feed that evidence in and all that evidence is considered. So um, I think if there is really a duty on the scientists as well to make sure that their, um, their information, the information and expertise that they have is actually reaching us as committee members, because that gives us the tools then to scrutinise government decisions and policies carefully. So please, Whenever there's an, a, a, an inquiry that's open, and we have a number of inquiries open just now, and you can check the committee's website for that, um, there is information there on how to submit evidence. So please do that. You all should have an active role in policy making. Thanks, Carol. And I, I guess just following on what Carol said, Google Common Science and Technology Committee, and you'll find our website and find all our open inquiries to submit to or get in touch by email and we're always happy to help. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, I think we have Jess Hogan. And Jess is representing the British Ecological Society. Jess. Hello, thank you so much for having me and letting me ask you this question. Uh, so my question is, as the role of hydrogen becomes vital to achieving net zero, 
Will local communities be provided an opportunity to invest or participate in the trials similar to that of community wind energy? Thank you. Um, I think we'll go to Catherine first, uh, and then Carol, then Greg, then Dawn. Catherine. Thanks, Jess. Good question. Um, we've just started an inquiry on hydrogen, and it's what's really interesting about it is it's coming up, it's not fixed and settled views on it, actually. You'll talk to one set of experts and they're like, this is huge for commercial. It's going, um, you, know, you, you know, you really need a big site because there's so many things within the process that you need to change. You'll speak to somebody else that's talking about putting it in as a mixture relatively safely within the existing natural gas network. Um, I think there is a need to start piloting and engaging with different communities. I think the thing that's coming across loud and clear that is settled, actually, is that it's very much dependent how we decarbonize the economy. It's very much dependent on your geography, and what you've got available to you, as well as having a blanket kind of on off switch. Um, I, I, I would I think whatever happens, we're all going to have to change the way we do stuff. And I think the only way you can do that, and one, check it works in the real world, um, you know, and isn't just, and, I don't, and when I say the real world, I don't necessarily just mean a scientific theory paper, but also, you know, what governments do with policy and the translation processes that that goes through. Um, so I think communities testing these things absolutely is the key to it. Because one thing that hasn't been thought of might cause a problem. One thing that hasn't been thought of in a different area might absolutely do it. Um, in terms of hydrogen specifically, I think we've, we've got to get our thinking caps on about that. I'd encourage you to kind of continue to follow the journey of the hydrogen inquiry that, that got started the last couple of weeks. I think it's going to be very interesting. Thank you, Catherine. Carol. Thanks very much. Um, good question, Jessica. And, um, yeah, as Catherine said, we have an inquiry open in, on hydrogen, so please feed in your evidence. Um, but uh, yeah, it's interesting because when we started talking about hydrogen as a fuel, and I remember it because I was still a physics teacher at that point, and we were doing lots of stuff projects with kids about hydrogen and how hydrogen was going to be this brilliant clean energy and everything else. And there was no talk of green or blue hydrogen at that point. It was just hydrogen was going to be the replacement for fossil fuels and we would, it would all be great. Um, I think we, there has to be a bit more nuance though. And, you know, the community projects are all very well, but unfortunately a lot of what we're talking about, certainly in the short term with hydrogen is blue hydrogen. So that's hydrogen produced from fossil fuels. Um, which is not great unless you've got carbon capture and storage going on as well. So, so I think it's it's a lot more complex. But in terms of, of small community, wouldn't it be fantastic if you could see a community that had some wind turbines, using the turbines to produce energy and using the electrolysis to produce hydrogen as a, as a fuel? And I suppose that's got to be that, that kind of of vision has got to be the way we're heading. We're probably a long way off yet, but even if we start in small steps, I think there, there is real potential there, especially in the UK. I mean, we, we are surrounded by water. We have such potential in renewables and hydrogen can really play a part in that. So yeah, I, I think your, your idea of community-based hydrogen sort of um, systems, I think is, is fabulous and maybe something that we need to consider more seriously. Thank you, Carol. Greg. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rule. Well, it's a, it's a great and topical question. Um, I'm going to treat or at least conform to what we've said before, which is we should be guided by the evidence. And we've just started this inquiry because it is quite difficult. In fact, um, we've got a whole load of written evidence, but I don't know whether you, did you see our session uh, last week, our first uh, evidence session? Well, look at it. It's on, um, uh, Ms. Rule might be able to put up a, a link to the to the website um, and you can see both a, a replay of the session and also there's a transcript of it but it was quite feisty so we had um, different scientists on some uh, were saying that it's kind of overhyped basically and the it is inherently inefficient and we ought not to be looking to rely on it or even to uh, to be uh, advantaging it particularly. Others 
said the opposite. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to to get to the bottom of this. As Carol said, I mean, it, it, what's not to like about the idea of local communities being sustainable and resilient and making a big contribution to getting to to net zero? So I think probably like all of us, I would love love it if the, if we find uh, that that is possible. But we have to be rigorous about it, and uh, and the part of the point of a a select committee, a scrutiny committee, is sometimes asking some of the difficult questions to ground it in reality. And so uh, it's going to be a very interesting few weeks ahead. We've got another session a bit later uh, this month, so, so do follow us. And do, as Carol said, do submit evidence uh, as well if you've got some particular interest and expertise in this. Thank you, Greg. Dawn. Yes, yeah, so there's not really a lot left to say apart from, you know, the the first line of um, your question as the role of hydrogen becomes vital to achieving net zero, I thought, is it vital? You know, I, I'm yet, you know, I'm yet to be convinced. So as Greg was saying, the, the committee's like looking into that. And I think it's important that we investigate that. There are some um, community schemes going on at the moment where there is money being invested. And I think, you know, I do think we have to change our mentality and thinking when it comes to uh, net zero and energy you know when i visited a small sort of village in india nothing went to waste you know the the cow dung was then uh, they used the gases off of that to cook with and then what was left fertilized the earth and it meant that the earth they could farm the earth for a lot longer um, so whereas our farming in the uk they say that we've only got 10 years left of farming left in, in some of the earth. So how do we replenish that? And so I think we do in a way have to change our mindset to how we look at our whole ecosystem and join it all together. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm yet to be convinced that um, hydrogen is vital to achieving net zero. But, you know, when the evidence comes in, I'll look at it and I'll go on that journey, on that learning journey. Thank you, Dawn. Jess, do you have any comments or reflections? Yeah, this is really great to, to hear from all of you. Um, I guess, so my research looks at onshore wind energy communities. So I guess the reason I ask this question is because one of the big challenges with wind energy, especially when you go to the highlands and islands, is that they produce too much energy. And so it's finding ways in which that you can still store that energy and bring it to other places. Um, and that's why I think hydrogen could become maybe not but you guys will find out in your inquiry maybe um, about whether or not it'll be vital for the future in terms of uh, renewables and that kind of path for what it will look like. Yeah, Justin, if I could come in, the scale of it too, you know, you know, how the excess energy that those communities are producing, does that work for those communities? But do we need a different solution for the for the larger conurbations that have huge energy needs? And then that's before you get to the fertilizer factory. Yeah, but it's a great question. Yeah, please put evidence in. Just to reinforce one of the points that um, I think it was Carol made about uh, interdisciplinary work. Um, one of the things that came up was the answer may depend on water resources, for example, uh, if it's um, if you're using electrolysis. Um, the, there are places where water is abundant. There are places where it's not. And so it may be suitable for in some places, but not others. And so uh, so we'll need to have the uh, the. the uh, meteorologists and the and those that specialise in uh, the science of water uh, to uh, hydrologists to uh, to advise us. Yeah, could I could I also just throw in Jessica just to get my tuppence worth here? Um, I always laugh when people talk about wind energy as being an unreliable source, um, and and I always say to them, "Well, you've not been to the west coast of Scotland um, because <laughs> it's pretty much constant there." So yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, Jess, for that question. Uh, we'll now move on to our next participant, uh, Georgina. Majro, uh, Georgina, I apologise. Majro, um, my minister is coming in the car across, so may I answer in the first one or two? Because I'm sorry I've got to run for business in the house and I didn't want to interrupt Georgina's flow. Yeah, do you need to leave now? No, but I... Fine. Yeah, sure. So uh, sorry, we'll, we'll bring you in, we'll bring you in all, first. All the time. Uh, bring you in first. Georgina, go ahead. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to end off, I'd like to ask a more personal question for each of you, and that is, what scientific discovery would you most like to see in your lifetime? Uh, we'll go Catherine first, then Dawn, then Greg, then Carol. Okay, I've done brilliant. I'm absolutely delighted. There's a list. Happily, you'll be spared it because my parliamentary duties are going to do. If uh, magic wand stuff, I want to know uh, how, how uh, quantum mechanics interacts with gravity. I want to know whether the, you know, human beings are brilliant throughout the entirety of the Industrial Revolution and before at using stuff that we think we understand for practical purposes. And we're already starting to do that with quantum entanglement. But we don't really have a grounded theoretical understanding of it. So I want to know if the double slit experiment is, because we've got holographic universe, because we've got straight, because string theory is correct, because it's the multiverse and multidimensional universe, or if we've just missed the really obvious. So that's mine. I want to, I want, is it the unified theory that's called? It'll underpin all the rest of it. Thanks, Catherine. Dawn. Um, so for me, I'd like to, I'd like to um, solve the biggest killer, uh, um, which is hunger. Um, and some will say, well, that's not a scientific solution. That's a political solution and will. But like how we farm, how we produce food, how we make sure people don't go hungry. Um, in the most poisonous society, that, that would be something that I would love to see in my lifetime. I'd like to, I'd also like to see um, the cure for um, Alzheimer's and uh, dementia. I think we're, there's some moves to discovering and understanding that. And I think that that is something that, again, with the willpower we can do. And I think cancer, right? I'd like to see more joined up thinking with cancer. I think there's a lot going on to, 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 to understand how cancer attacks different people. Um, and, uh, and lastly, yeah, I think we've all got lists, right? <laughs> uh, I think lastly would probably be um, uh, electric cars, um, how, how, they will, how we can make them more affordable. Um, my uh, friend got a new electric car and um, it's just got a normal plug that you just plug into a normal plug socket. The plug is a car. I was like, oh, when did that happen? That, I didn't, you know, I was still thinking they had the biggest. I was like, okay, I haven't really been paying that much attention. Um, so I'd like to see that. And, um, and, and Tesla is named after a woman, uh, scientist, which I didn't know, which I was like, wow, that quite blew my mind. So that's kind of a bit of uh, uh, the top end of my list. But there's more, but obviously I don't want to take up 10 minutes. <laughs> Greg. Thank you, Maestro. Well, I'm going to choose. I thought I was just going to choose one, but I'm going to have a list as well. Um, uh, let me, I'll mention two. I think um, the first would be to stop antimicrobial resistance. If you think of some of the, the progress the world has made uh, over uh, the decades of the 20th century um, in terms uh, of having cures for diseases that were very fatal. Um, the idea that we could go backwards because there is resistance um, that uh, can be acquired is obviously very worrying. And so if we could, if we could stop that, and there's a lot of work that's, that we're doing as a country with others around the world uh, on that, I think that would be uh, important. Um, but since, uh, since others are, uh, are, are adding others, I, I, I follow Dawn's view. I think, um, uh, and what Carol said about um, the, the wind in, uh, in the west of Scotland, um, it, I think we're on the brink of a real transformation in energy. If we can get all of our electricity needs from completely green sources, for example, wind, um, and we're able to store it so we have as much of it as we need whenever we need it, then we could transform something that for, for centuries, in fact, really from the, it sounds rather dramatic, but from the dawn of time when people had to go out and gather firewood and then had to mine coal and, uh, and then, you know, drill for oil and gas and all the rest of it. You know, energy 
was precious, was rare, was expensive, and you know, led to, to poverty, it changed behavior. If we could get to the point, given the abundance of energy we have, not just off the west coast of Scotland, but off the east coast as well and, uh, and around the world, so that there's plenty of energy there from wind, if we could capture it and store it so that the use of energy is not something that you have to eke out and is precious, but can be abundant. A bit like, you know, we're, we're watching on each other on, on Zoom here. We kind of don't think about sort of metering in the way that we did in the early years of the internet. So we don't sort of log on with a modem for a few minutes and think it's going to run up our phone bill. And our practice has changed. We kind of Google everything. We kind of look things up. We all don't think twice about joining each other in calls. If we can do that with energy, I think this would be absolutely transformational. But I think storage and hydrogen may be one such, uh, but batteries uh, another one. Carol. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I only had one as well, but I'm now going to have now expanded it. So, um, so the, the first thing is, I suppose, slightly sci-fi, but I mean, as we're talking on a video screen just now that I used to see whenever I was growing up in the 70s and 80s on Star Trek and think would never happen, um, maybe, we should, maybe we can go sci-fi. So one of the frustrations I always have whenever I'm moving about the city is that I'm trying to go that way and somebody else is going that way and somebody else is going that way and somebody else is going that way. If there was a way that we could efficiently just move direction or change change place without having all the kind of interactions with each other on the way i think think that would be great so maybe some sort of um teleportation system or something i think we're a bit off that yet so that's my that's my big sci-fi one um probably the more realistic one is um following on from what don said is a, a method of delivering water to those in need and clean water and we know that I mean there are so many people in the world for whom clean water is is not available to them. Um, and when we're talking here, I mean, like I say, we're talking on Zoom, we have incredible technology. The problem is that those without clean water are generally in the developing world. And there's not a lot of money in that in terms of developing the science. There's not a lot of financial reward for those that provide it and that's a difficulty so um so really if i that's probably that's probably my biggie is a method of delivering safe clean water to every person in the planet regardless is of whether they're living in a famine area or not so water for irrigation and water for for drinking and, and washing but probably just to shove a, a final one in and um, we started off talking about a uh, fusion or Catherine did very early on in our, our meeting this afternoon. Um, and I think fusion energy is something that has great potential, probably has, we're talking more about hydrogen these days. Um, nuclear has raised its head again, of course, um, fusion energy is a form of nuclear, but without the, the, uh, without the, the radioactive byproducts at the end of it. So fusion energy could be transformational and I think that is something that might answer all the other things as well in terms of delivering water. If you've got a way of producing energy in um, from from basically not very much, then potentially we could we could transform how we live our lives. And can I, can I come in? I know I, I do so many, but there's one other thing that um, I think of as well, and, and sort of Greg and Carol just reminded me of this. I'd really like for countries like um, in Africa and the Caribbean and Asia, you know, every now and again, um, the media comes out with this new trendy uh, drug or this trendy like aloe vera. Oh my God, aloe vera is so amazing or coconut is so hydrating. And you think, well, you know, my parents told me this a, a long time ago or, you know, like merengue, which is something you know, people say, oh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a magical cure for headache. And I think, you know, pharmaceutical companies will take something and produce something else to make a lot of money from it. Whereas things that grow naturally um, and are the riches of other countries that get stripped of all of that. I would love to see in my lifetime uh, that, that, that we just use the natural products from various countries, even our resistance to 
to um, antibiotics at the moment. They're now saying that um, uh, cannabis oil, for instance, will, might be used to, to help with our resistance to antibiotics. And I just think there's so much stuff that has got lost and corrupted along the way. And if we just go back to all the natural stuff, um, it will be beneficial in so many different ways. And I would like to see and, and have people appreciate, appreciate that in my lifetime. Thank you all. Uh, Georgina, I think we'd all be interested to hear your answer to the question. Um, I think the biggest issue we're facing, well, one of the biggest issues is the plastic problem. So in my lifetime, I would really like to see a solution to that, whether it be uh, biodegradable plastics, uh, single-use plastics, or maybe digestible plastics, which we could then, you know, digest in some sustainable and eco-friendly way. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that brings this session to a conclusion. Um, I think Karen or Harriet will post a survey in the chat. Please do take a few moments to fill that in. Greg, Carol, Dawn, Catherine, on behalf of everybody here today, thank you for your time and your engagement. Uh, and to repeat our earlier thanks as well to Sir Patrick, uh, Minister Soloway and the Shadow Minister Chi Anwar. Uh, it's been a very insightful and engaging day. Um, and thank you as well to the organizers of this fantastic event. Um, I think I'm just going to name check Stephen, Karen, Harriet, Beth and Philippa, who've worked uh, incredibly hard behind the scenes to put all this together. And finally, thank you to everybody for attending.